wanted to welcome Dan Brown, uh, Head of Communications from the Linux Foundation, up to talk to us about open source, the open source energy landscape. Welcome, Dan. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. And uh, I know I'm the last thing between you and lunch, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, so uh, I'll give you just a little quick overview of Linux Foundation Energy for those who aren't familiar. Um, I think most of you know who the Linux Foundation is, but the Linux Foundation Energy is a sub-foundation. We're an umbrella um, that is focused, uh, unlike our sister foundation, the Green Software Foundation, that you've heard a lot about, um, rather than focusing on how to make things like software less carbon intensive, um, what we're looking at is how to use technology to make electricity less carbon intensive in the first place. So um, we host uh, about 25 different projects right now. We have um, two or three more coming on soon. And these cover all aspects of the energy sector. So the entire stack from generation, transmission, distribution, down to end use. So it could be something like um, digitalizing a utility control room or virtualizing power substations so that they can be more efficient. We can better uh, measure, monitor, verify, and report on emissions. Um, and uh, overall onboard renewables faster by ensuring interoperability. So enough about us. What I'm here to talk about today, though, is some recent research that we've conducted. Uh, there are three different reports. One, I was very excited to see the folks from Bristow's um, reference quite heavily today. That's made me so happy. I, that's why we do this, is so that people can benefit from it. Um, so the first, though, I'm going to talk about is our energy transformation readiness study. So what we looked at here uh, through a partnership with Linux Foundation Research, as well as a number of other organizations, um, was how, um, how prepared utilities are for the energy transition, how far along they are in that transition, and the part that open source is playing in it. So this was a quantitative piece of research. We surveyed hundreds of utilities in uh, North America, Europe, and Asia for this report. Um, and we, I'll start with the good news, and most of it is good news. Um, so the respondents overwhelmingly recognized, pretty much universally, they have accepted that they must digitalize. Um, the old way of running your power grid and your utility, where you own all the power generation systems and you send, them over the send the power over the transmission lines and it gets used by homes and businesses, is not sustainable. We need to move to distributed energy resources like solar, wind, hydro, et cetera. Um, but that presents challenges because that is not the way that they are used to working, these utilities and grid operators. And so they have recognized that in order to work in this new um, way, they will have to digitalize their systems. So that's great. That way we can have things like smart home energy management, EV charging, um, and improved demand response so that you aren't relying so much on fossil fuels. Uh, as a matter of fact, 76% of them said that they not only have already developed a clear digitalization plan, but they've started to implement that plan. Uh, the remainder, almost all of those, either have a plan developed but not yet implemented, or they are in the midst of developing that plan. So again, good news. They recognize there's a problem and that technology can help them solve it. Now let's talk about the uh, part that open source is playing in this. Um, so we asked these folks, you know, what do you think about open source? What are the benefits of using open source technologies um, to digitalize and uh, uh, modernize grids and your power systems in general? Number one, cost reduction. They just see open source is a more efficient way from a cost perspective than um, relying on proprietary technologies that often result in vendor lock-in. Uh, additionally, it's, it's faster. Uh, we can innovate faster because we get an, an entire community together, um, including the utilities, including energy um, generators, including researchers, um, uh, technology companies, startups, and the traditional vendors. They're, they've realized that they have to, to um, evolve as well. It's not just the systems, but also the vendors building these systems. 
Um, and so these were the benefits that folks identified, and that's great. We want to keep encouraging that. Um, but now the bad news, there, there are some, some barriers uh, that um, were discovered through this research, and they weren't terribly surprising. I think that a lot of other industries that have gone through this type of transition, for instance, um, telecommunications and networking, uh, also went from a very vendor lock-in, proprietary type system to an open source one. Um, but there were always concerns about performance, the concerns about support. Is, does the support exist? You know, can you, you can't just adopt this uh, program off of GitHub. Um, you need folks who are able to actually support that. And security is always a concern in any industry. Um, so the great thing for us out of this research though, by doing this and identifying what these barriers are, what these folks see as the benefits, um, allows us to know what knowledge gaps we need to fill. So um, there's this need to reach an industry consensus about what the best practices are. They've already come to consensus about digitalization. There's kind of a mixed bag with whether open source is the best approach. Um, but what is missing is this consensus, um, both on open source and on how to do it. So this report was just a starting place. Um, it was a way for us to kind of get a lay of the land, help the industry understand where they stand and where, uh, where open source can play a, a role in further digital transformation. So the next report I'm gonna talk about um, is a little bit more focused. So this is on microgrid technology specifically. Um, this was a, uh, unlike the last one that was a quantitative study, this was a purely qualitative research report. So um, it was sponsored by FutureWay, and um, we worked with them along with a team of advisors and again, Linux Foundation Research to interview 17 different subject matter experts in different geographies around the world about um, the part that microgrids, the part that open source is playing in microgrid technologies currently and what is needed to expand microgrids using open source. So we found that open source presence in the microgrids uh, market is very nascent. Um, microgrids, for those who aren't familiar, these are like smaller grids. It may be a neighborhood, it may be a small city, it may be some sort of community, it may be a business um, uh, that has built their own grid and it may be solar panels or it may just be batteries or you know they're they're sourcing the power um, themselves not from a larger grid that's run by a utility and so um, these are very common especially in the global south like africa and south and south america um, where there are communities that are just too far off the main grid um, to, to connect and so build their own smaller ones um, the thing is, a lot of these are just put together very piecemeal using like whatever they could find um, to build these grids. And so it is, they are relying on more legacy technologies that they could just pull in and that they knew would work together. Um, so there's not a lot of open source presence there right now. Um, however, there was agreement amongst these folks that um, open source has uh, a lot of, pot of potential to further advance the microgrids market. So the way that we can do that and the reason for doing that um, is to focus on consensus and collaboration. You folks are open source pros for the most part, so you know this is, this is old hat to everyone in this room. Um, we need to create standards and technologies that can interoperate with one, one another. Um, the benefit for this is not just for enabling folks to build microgrids faster in areas that may not currently have electricity or have very limited amounts of electricity. If that interoperability exists, it means that as grids expand, you can connect those microgrids to the larger grids. Um, that's a problem even in places like Europe and North America right now where microgrids do exist. Uh, they are not necessarily interoperable with a larger grid because different proprietary technologies are being used. But by using open source, we can prevent that problem um, and help speed onboarding of these, uh, uh, of these resources um, that in the long run can help with um, decarbonization because if you have a microgrid that's running all solar and you can eventually plug it into a larger grid, 
that can be a resource that other areas can rely on um, when they are short of power in other areas. So um, open source is enabling innovation in this area or will be able to enable innovation in this area through by developing new business models, um, new talent pipelines, cost reductions, and we would argue improving security. Um, it presents, uh, represents a cheaper alternative to proprietary or closed source microgrids, um, which helps lower the financial barriers of entry and creates a pool of resources um, for knowledge generation. Um, but there are some things that need to happen in order to achieve this, uh, uh, this transformation in the microgrid market. Um, to get up to a point where open source is being more wi widely adopted, we need to support the incumbents that are already um, running these microgrids um, because for the most part, they're facing pretty big economic hurdles. And so we need to share data with them. We need to provide educational resources and we just in general need to make sure that we're aligning goals. Um, additionally, policies need to change. Um, current policy making uh, is very focused on centralized grid infrastructure. And so it's difficult, there need to be changes um, from a regulatory and um, government perspective to transition away from that centralized infrastructure and support a more distributed landscape. Mm -hmm. And then the last um, report that I'm going to touch on was the one that was uh, touched on in the earlier presentation, which is the open source sustainability ecosystem. Um, for this, uh, we worked with a group called Proton Types. It's actually a volunteer community group that has been doing this research for a couple years um, and are in the process of bringing it formally into Linux Foundation Energy. Um, and so for this, um, essentially we analyzed 1,339 different projects uh, with open source repositories um, that have a sustainability focus. All of these projects um, are focused on different areas of sustainability. You can see this is all broken out into all of these many, many, many different areas. Um, everything from energy systems, like I've kind of been talking about, but also things like um, atmosphere or forestry monitoring. Um, it could really be anything with a sustainability focus, not just energy. Um, the coloring here relates to how widely distributed the development work is in each of these areas. So um, for some, like geothermal, you'll see is very dark blue. That means that there aren't many, the open source projects are pretty much just like one organization running them. Um, as you get to the greener ones, that means that they're broader communities with a lot of different organizations contributing. So here, um, this is actually pretty much the same thing that I just showed, but broken down in a different way. Um, to demonstrate which fields have the most open source projects in them. About half are things like biosphere, hydrosphere, water, um, energy system modeling, mobility and transportation, and buildings. Um, and that's because there's a lot of maturity in these fields. A lot of these projects um, started in government um, or in research, uh, academic and research organizations. Um, a lot of the newer ones that have fewer projects um, are, are just kind of beginning to start. The great thing here, though, is that we can see where the gaps exist. That's kind of the point of this report, is helping us see where, um, where there's already a lot of open source available and where there's not, so that we can encourage developer communities to focus on the right areas. Um, we looked at a lot of different, um, I literally am going through like five of the dozens and dozens of different areas we looked at, but um, uh, longevity is, uh, we think, a good important health indicator. If it's, a project's been a lot around for a long time, it's probably more healthy if it's still active. Um, uh, it's about four and a half years is the average age of these 1,339 projects. Um, but you'll see in the last few years, there's been quite a drop. Um, we're not getting as many projects started. And so um, that is a little bit concerning. And so we want to um, analyze, and we are doing this currently, analyzing why that's happening. Um, and if it's just, there are areas that are saturated now, and so we don't need so many new ones, or if um, something is being missed. 
Um, we also looked at who has the most active contributors. These are just the top 40. Um, but you can see by the time you already get down to 40, there's less than 50 contributors. Um, so essentially that means a lot of these projects are very small. But that also means that there's a lot of opportunities for developers who want to get involved in this space and would like to contribute. Um, there are just so many options out there to pick an area of interest and find an active community and jump right in and start contributing to it. So what we've done with all of this um, data is we've created a, and this is hosted on GitHub, um, a, um, a landscape. Uh, all of the projects, you'll see it's 1343 now because a few have been added since we published the report. Um, fully open source, take a look at it. It's just l.lfenergy.org. Um, you can dig into more details on all of these projects, link out to their websites, their repositories, et cetera. Um, and see how they interact with one another. Um, and if you have projects that we missed, feel free to add them. It just is e as easy as a pull request. The last thing out of this report, there were 21 different recommendations. I don't have time to go through all of those. Um, so these are just a few of them, like enhancing collaboration between state and non-state actors, closing knowledge gaps, um, adapting and extending existing solutions to the uh, global south where they're uh, seeing less adoption, um, et cetera. So I encourage you to take a look at all of the research and um, feel free to get in touch. My contact information is up here. Um, we're always happy to um, have more contributors and, um, and to speak with anyone uh, who is interested in, um, in sharing their knowledge. So thank you very much. Thank you.